is crushed. Belgium is smashed. This is the prelude to England's finest hour. Britain's sea power rescues Britain's army, but at a cost of abandoning all its equipment and all its stores. The British stand stripped of their armor, their weapons struck from their hands. It is the hour of catastrophe. It is the hour of the brown triumph. The path of glory leads to the forest of Compiègne. With vulgar histrionics, the Nazis staged France's humiliation in the same railway car where the Germans capitulated 22 years earlier. The French surrender, and it is Hitler's turn to dance. Conquest ends at the English Channel, where sea power blocks the way. Yet with the French ports in German hands, the striking power of the Nazis grows enormously. The enemy moves into powerful new positions that menace England's very shores. Now the submarine bases are a mere night's run from the ship lanes that sustain England's life. Now the U-boats are at England's throat. Six weeks of Blitzkrieg has made them ten times as dangerous as before. 20 times as potent. And from newly acquired air bases on England's threshold comes something new to warfare, new to history. An attempt to pound the world power into submission by bombardment from the sky. Coolly and brilliantly, the English organized their defenses meeting the new menace with new methods. But the Nazi squadrons come over around the clock. Caring not how she expends her blood, sweat, and tears, England stands firm. Hitler does not force her to her knees. A democratic people wins the battle of Britain. But for Britain's leaders, the situation remains desperate. If freedom is to survive in the old world, the new world will have to act. 
in America, public opinion is slowly, surely forming. The issues are becoming clear. Congress moves boldly to safeguard American security by forthright aid to Great Britain. destroyers, needs them badly. America has many left over from World War I. Stop-gap strategy in the Battle of the Atlantic calls for an exchange of destroyers for British bases in the Caribbean and the Atlantic. Step by step, America begins forging her armor. The absolute necessity for naval strength is demonstrated by Britain's plight. America needs not one, but two navies. One to guard the Atlantic, the other to counter aggression in the Pacific. The shipyards begin working treble ships. Merchantmen, warships, auxiliaries begin sliding down the ways in increasing tempo. All out production becomes the goal throughout the land. The pace of preparedness quickens. themselves are no longer enough. From coast to coast, the barracks go up by the thousands to receive draftees by the hundreds of thousands. Far off areas become vital to the United States. Greenland lies at the crossroads of the North Atlantic. In May of 1940, she asked United States protection. Her creolite mines and weather stations are denied the Germans. American Marines move into Iceland a year later, relieving the British garrison there. The Leathernecks forestall the German threat. Whoever possesses Iceland holds a pistol pointed at England, the United States, and Canada. In midsummer 1941, Churchill and Roosevelt meet off Newfoundland to proclaim the Atlantic Charter. The four freedoms. Freedom of speech and of worship. From want and from fear. But these are the realities that support the ideals. The ships, the men, the supplies on which all depends. The ships plod along the North Atlantic convoy routes at dangerously sluggish speed, their pace regulated by the slowest merchantman in the convoy. And the slower the convoy, the easier it falls into the trap of roving U-boats. The shortest course to Europe lies across the North Atlantic. 